Welcome to the LACNETS Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Yen. I'm the LACNETS Program Director, as well as a caregiver and advocate for my husband who is living with NET. In each podcast episode, we talk to a NET expert who answers your top 10 questions. This podcast is for educational purposes only and does not constitute medical advice. Please discuss your questions and concerns with your physician. Welcome, everyone. It's great to have you on our LACNETS podcast, and welcome, Dr. Hendafar. So before we get started, I thought I'd introduce our guest today, Dr. Hendafar from Cedar sinai Medical Center. He's someone very special to us here at LACNETS because he's been with us since the very beginning of LACNETS. He's been a close partner and colleague and involved in many of our in-person meetings and annual conferences. Dr. Hennifar is the Director of the Neuroendocrine Tumor Program at Cedar sinai Medical Center and an Associate Professor of Medicine. He's very dedicated to clinical research and patient care. We're really excited to have you here with us today, Dr. Hendafar. And if you might introduce yourself a little bit and tell us how you got interested in the care of neuroendocrine tumor patients. Good afternoon, Lisa. Thanks so much for having me. Of course, LACNETS is very special to me as well. And it's always a pleasure to join you and talk about neuroendocrine tumors. So my interest in neuroendocrine tumors began when I worked with Dr. Edward Wallen. He was a senior physician when I was just starting out in medical oncology at Cedars. And he, he was uh, something else. For those who are lucky enough to still work with him, I know he's in New York right now, continuing his legacy. But when he was here, you know, these were a rare disease that I hadn't seen much of in fellowship. Even though I trained at the county hospital where we saw I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of patients. You know, this was still a very a rare disease and, and you know, really not that much formal training was available. We didn't really get more than a couple of questions on our boards and there was no neuroendocrine tumor specialist where I trained. And so it was a, a whole new world in a way. And, you know, Dr. Wellen was kind enough to kind of teach me and show me I attended his tumor boards where I learned things that I never knew. You know, I started to attend the North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society conferences and network with other uh, physicians who are interested in neuroendocrine tumors and slowly gained the knowledge necessary to care for patients with this disease. And after a while, um, I myself have become somebody who just through the, you know, learning about the disease and just through sheer numbers of seeing patients, uh, fortunate enough to be able to care for them and to help them out and really contribute in a meaningful way. So it's been a, it's been a great, and that's something I never could have predicted. I don't think anyone could ever grow up as a child and say, I want to be a neuroendocrine tumor specialist, right? <laughs> That'd be, but it's just, just interesting the way life works out. And uh, very fortunate to have met you know, Giovanna and Bessie, who introduced me to this group, and then, of course, to Lisa and Lindsay and the whole team. Wow, thank you for your kind words. It's so wonderful. You had such a wonderful mentor in Dr. Wolin, yeah. and it's what an amazing journey, right? Going from not seeing any amazing. to now seeing many, many <laughs> neurotic patients, and we're so grateful that you do. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. So, um, Dr. Hendervar, our first question is this. I've just been diagnosed with neuroendocrine tumor. What do I need to know? So this is a a very good question. It's something that uh, for the ones a patient hears that they have a neuroendocrine tumor for the first time, I think it's quite overwhelming. It might even be overwhelming for the provider because many of the providers don't even know what to tell the patients. So I think the first thing to do is to get a Patho, you know, pathology report that says what the diagnosis that you have. And, and this is, uh, you know, usually you're going to be told you have a neuroendocrine tumor based on some kind of biopsy. So that would be essential what you need. You need that piece of paper and you need to find, and if it does in fact say that you have a neuroendocrine tumor, you should find a neuroendocrine tumor specialist somewhere in your area who can be able to understand what that report means and help guide you in the right direction. So I think that's the most essential. You just gotta get that path report in your hand. And that's the key to taking those first steps. Okay, well, you know, as you know, it's very overwhelming getting the diagnosis, trying to know these things. 
And then what do I need to do next? I, I think it's what's really important is take a deep breath. Having a neuroendocrine tumor doesn't necessarily mean you have a cancer like other cancers. It might not mean that you need chemo. It might not mean that you need other treatments. So I would try to like not jump ahead and come to too many conclusions. Just find the right team. Once you do that, you'll be able to get the appropriate staging. That will, you know, which staging is when you get the right pictures that shows where the cancer is. You know, hopefully it, it's just localized, or if not, you know, exactly what you're dealing with. You'll have that pathology report reviewed, meaning the pathologist at a center who sees neuroendocrine tumors more frequently will request the path to be sent over, which is the tissue. And they will review that tissue to make sure that you do in fact have a neuroendocrine tumor and not another cancer that's actually much more likely. Something that you should always look out for too is pathology code. Pathologists have their own language. So they'll sometimes say neuroendocrine features or they'll say neuroendocrine tumor or they'll say neuroendocrine carcinoma. And those three things mean completely different. They're completely different meanings. And I wouldn't expect the patients to be able to read that and understand that as much as, you know, these are important distinctions that, you know, your, neuro, your provider will read through. And if they have the appropriate experience, they would understand exactly what's being suggested at the PATH report. So again, you need a PATH report, a neuroendocrine tumor team, PATH report gets sent, pathology gets reviewed, and you go from there, you get your staging, you get your opinions. Eventually you'll get, if you're in a center, you'll have a multidisciplinary discussion because neuroendocrine tumors, there are many ways that you can approach this problem. And it's only fair that if you have a consensus opinion from many different specialists about how to proceed, and that's what you do. That's very insightful, Dr. Hendafar. And as you said, there's almost a whole language to it. So as patients yeah. and as allies in the community, we're trying to learn to speak net. And it's good to know we're not alone. And it's not just, you know, one expert like you also, it's a whole multidisciplinary team. Right. Um, well, one question that often comes up is what really causes net? Particularly, did I do anything to cause it? I as a patient, or does stress cause it? What also makes net tumors grow or spread? And I guess there's a lot of anxiety around, is there something I should or shouldn't do to keep it from spreading? These are great questions. So, you know, neuroendocrine tumors do come from so many different parts of the body. The only one that has an association with a risk factor are those who have small cell lung cancer, and that's associated with smoking. Outside of that, most neuroendocrine tumors do not have a modifiable behavioral risk factor that you could change. Furthermore, it's hard to recommend any dietary changes or any lifestyle changes to most of our patients because those don't really contribute to the disease. And if you go even deeper and we start to go even, you know, I'll start to make less sense to most people is that a lot of what we understand about most tumors, the, you know, genomic underpinnings of tumor suppressors, et cetera, being mutated. We don't really have that as much in neuroendocrine tumors. So there's a lot of a deeper understanding that needs to be put together before we communicate exactly what, to, what, what a patient can do or not do. But I would say in general, it's very clear that you don't have to necessarily change your diet. You don't necessarily have to do anything different. I do recommend that you exercise, everybody should be exercising 150 minutes per week, especially patients who have a malignancy, because that'll help give you the strength and vitality and optimal health to continue to do well. And also it's important that you eat well, you know, take an opportunity, even though you might not have caused a tumor, but if you have a tumor, it's a good time to take stock of the diet, you know, eat whole foods as much as possible, avoid red meat, avoid tobacco entirely, limit alcohol, all those things that, you know, you always talk about doing, maybe this is a good opportunity to try to incorporate as much of them as you can. And also, it's, it's also because of the disease and because the treatments can really modify 
the way you utilize nutrients, a dietitian consult is usually uh, very helpful. And I know dietitians come to LACNETs a lot, so you can probably click to uh, another, another podcast, probably be more, more interesting than mine too, about uh, nutrition. You can do that. Thank you so much for that reassurance. I, it's helpful to hear from you as the net expert that there's nothing that the patients, we as patients do to, to cause neuroendocrine tumor. And I also really like your holistic approach to things, right? Um, diet, exercise, and we know that you practice what you preach as an avid uh, uh, cyclist and, and someone who exercises. Yeah, I love, I love exercising. I don't necessarily recommend, actually, I got into it because one of our patients who was a neuroendocrine tumor patient, she's a very accomplished open water swimmer. We live near the Pacific Ocean, so she goes and swims pretty regularly outside. And uh, I've known her for many years and she you know, would tell me I, I have to start swimming and I don't swim. I know how to swim, but I'm not, I've never been in a high school team or any other, so she would come and I'd see her every few months. And she's okay, you started swimming yet? I said, no, I have not started swimming yet. And she's like, well, they go here, you can start. This is who you need to, to be your coach. And after months and months and months of her uh, persistence, I did, I did. I went to, a, you know, I'm a, not a good swimmer. And she put me in a master swimming class, which I learned on my first day was full of people who've been swimming their whole life. So they couldn't even put me in the slow lane. They had to put me in the, you have to learn how to swim lane. <laughs> My own private little area, the pool away from everybody else. But, you know, because of her, uh, you know, I found I loved swimming. So I still swim to this day about, I think, two, three years now, swimming regularly. And I convinced some of my friends to do it. And we, we do triathlons together. None of us are as good of a swimmer as she is, I got to admit. But it's definitely been fun. I love that story. I love to hear how you've been inspired by patients. Yeah, by patients. yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know if it's inspired or told what to do, but it's pretty, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. But she's, she's great. That. She's a great swimmer. It's, uh, she's always ranking uh, yeah. really high. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Well, and it just goes to show, right, that we can be thriving despite living with the disease. And Absolutely. That, right. Yeah. And that you are learning from your patients as well. So exactly. wonderful. It is. So wonderful. You know, I guess another kind of follow-up question to what causes it um, that often comes up is, is this just genetic? So should I be having genetic testing? And should my family members, especially if I have kids, should they get screened or tested for NET? No, that's a great question. I mean, genetic syndromes that contribute to neuroendocrine tumors are very rare. So does that mean you should get tested or not get tested? I think it would have to do it, it would require a conversation with your provider. I think uh, neuroendocrine tumor specialists would know when uh, it would be appropriate to test. If there's a constellation of findings, that would be suspicious. If there is a young age, you know, if, you, if you're told that you have a paraganglioma or you were told you have a pheochromocytoma, these are neuroendocrine tumors of different organs that are kind of a lot more associated with genetic syndromes. So there are certain clues and certain types that you might be more concerned. If you have, you know, a thymic carcinoid, if you've had a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor at a very young age, there are certain things that could, you know, Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, which is a gastronoma. So there's a few things out there that could make you more suspicious for a genetic syndrome. You know, if, if you are suspicious, if you think that, hey, even though, I know that something's not right here. I have a family member with a neuroendocrine tumor and I keep telling my, you know, my provider thinks that, you know, I don't need genetic testing, but if you're really concerned about it, everyone has the right, I think, to genetic testing. Um, it's very simple. It tends to, it's almost always covered if the appropriate guidelines are met. And if not, there are affordable ways to have it done. So I don't think it can hurt, especially with the rare disease. I would say the vast majority of patients have no genetic syndrome, more than 90%. And we see patients who have syndromes. I mean, they come seek out our care. So I think my patient group is probably more enriched for, for people with MEN, uh, SDH deficiencies, et cetera. So the long answer is, uh, well, the short answer is that, no, you probably don't need it, 
but if you think you need it, you should get it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's really helpful. And that is also reassuring as well to know and that. Then, can... And then how to test yourself, right? So then the other part of it is, do you test family members? Well, you always, and anytime you get genetic testing, you always test the person with the tumor. And then if it's negative, you end it. There's no reason to test anybody else. And if it's positive, then you proceed with the help of the genetic counselor. So there's very specific approaches and guidelines depending on what the underlying syndrome is. These have all been worked out by very smart people. So it's just checking boxes. If you do have a certain issue, then how to take care of the family is all gonna be baked in. They'll know exactly what they need to do. Thank you for that. That's really helpful um, and very clear. Thank you for making that clear. Um, another question that kind of comes up along this line, thinking of family and wanting to be around, but as you know, many people come to your office asking, how long do I have? We want to know in terms of planning and what to expect. This, this is a very difficult question to answer because it really depends on what type of neuroendocrine tumor. So what's the site of origin? It depends on what's the grade of the tumor. And then it depends on where it's metastasized to. And with those you know, three pieces of information, the prognosis can differ a lot. I mean, we're talking about going from you know, months to decades. So these details are really important. For the vast majority of my patients, they're going to do incredibly well compared to any other cancer. And normally, I wouldn't even think that we have to discuss about that important question, how long do I have? Because it's so long where they might be just as likely to have another problem or another cause that would cause them, you know, bigger problem. They could have bigger problems in their life, you know, whether it's heart disease, other types of chronic illnesses, et cetera. So, you know, there are a few patients that, that it's important to talk to them about it. I think that the physicians would know who needs that kind of a conversation, but it never hurts if you're, if you really don't know and you're really worried about it, it never hurts to just directly ask that, that very question, how long do I have? And you can, you deserve an answer if it's, if you really want to know, and you know, the doctor can look up, I mean, they can never give you an exact number, but they can say based on, you know, statistical looks on patients in the SEER database, they can say, okay, this is what we would give a guesstimate uh, of what to expect. But in general, though, I, I think in this disease, for most of the patients, it's going to be um, very difficult to get the kind of answer that you'd want because there's going to be a lot of uncertainty. And the best way to figure out the answer to that question is probably going to be a little bit of time. Give your team a little bit of time to see how things are going. And at the same time, you know, just start to think about, you know, well, what is, what is my team telling me? What is that? And then what are my values? What do I want to accomplish? What other things are important to me? And maybe start communicating that to your team because usually when the question is how long do I have, it's actually a very general question for something more specific that somebody's thinking about. So, you know, when my patients are specific with me, sometimes, you know, we understand each other a little bit better so some, sometimes someone will say, well, you know, my child right now is six or 10 and I want to make sure I see them to high school. And then I can say, yeah, that's not a problem. <laughs> you know, these are the things. So very specific things as usual, people are really, when they ask a question like, like, like how long do I have? They're thinking more specifically. So I think these are great conversations to have with your providers and just to talk about it kind of open up as much as you can to just tell them what's really concerning you. What are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish? What are you worried about? I think that might be just as important as talking about what your scans show and everything else, because, you know, although you are new to this scenario, you know, the physician has had the, whether they like it or not, they've had the opportunity to meet thousands of people in a similar scenario. And you can maybe draw on lessons learned from that collective experience, so to speak. So I, I think just go ahead and, and get right to it and say what you, you know, ask the, quite the direct questions that you really want to have answered. I think it's great. 
That's really insightful, Dr. Hennifar, really opening up that conversation. And it, it really involves a level of trust that you're building. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, opening up, you develop the trust, right? Because if you make yourself a little bit more vulnerable, then the doctor will, will share also. So sometimes it's just someone kind of has to jump in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. That's really beautiful. Um, and I guess kind of along those lines, to segue from there, um, how do I know then if my tumors are growing or spreading? I mean, fortunately, in, for neuroendocrine tumors, you don't really feel them, which is a blessing. Thank God. They're not, they're not that painful. Sometimes they can be. And so for those who are having pain from them, I'm sorry about that. My heart goes out to you. But for the most part, they're painless. And markers are not that many great markers. Some patients, you can check the urine 5-H-I-A-A, and everyone else will be checking things like promogranin, which isn't such a great marker. So, you know, it's really hard to tell from the blood tests if it's growing or spreading. So what we frequently do are, are scans. And fortunately, for the most part, most of the patients grow pretty slowly. So we do scan six months apart, and we compare them to the scan that was done previously, and then compare them within the context of all the scans. That's sometimes hard to do. It requires a little bit of diligence, you know, not just comparing two scans, but a set of three, a set of four. And, you know, the radiologists who have come to know this disease, they do make a note to go back a, a year or two or three, four, just to kind of get an idea of what's going on and to convey that in the reports. So that that's how we usually know. If Pictures like MRIs and CT shows that tumors are growing uh, or something's changed. We typically order what we call functional testing. And sometimes, and for our disease, that's somatostatin, scintography. And normally it's a gallium 68. There are variations of that. Um, you'll hear in different name brands. You'll hear you know, copper scans. You can do those as well. But basically they all show the uptake of the somatostatin receptor. And they're basically what we call PET scans. And these PET scans specific for neuroendocrine tumors show us a lot about, you know, is this tumor spreading in just one or two places? Is it moving from one organ to another? What exactly is happening? How many, um, what is the extent of the involvement? So those are the things that we kind of use. Those are our tools that we have to kind of get an idea uh, if the tumors are really changing in a significant way. For the most part, and I explained this to my patients, all neuroendocrine tumors grow. And no matter what we do, they're gonna grow. We just want them to grow incredibly slowly, right? Because there's no way to get the tumor if it's not growing from something. So the expectation that they'll never grow and just freeze completely is not what we expect. We expect them not only do they grow slowly, but with the therapies that we have, we well, can make them to grow even more slowly to the point where you'll outlive, you know, there's no, they won't cause a problem. So that's one thing that's hard to, you know, explain. So if somebody, someone might say, well, my tumor has grown one millimeter in a year, you know, I'm just like ready to do high five and jump up and down in the clinic. I'm really excited and happy. And the patient looks at me like, what's wrong with you? It's grown a millimeter. I'm like, one millimeter, it's nothing. <laughs> and then we have this conversation. And then I say, well, one millimeter a year, we'll take that, right? Because in 10 years, that's one centimeter. And then like, that's not that big. And then, and, you know, so we, this is something that yeah, we have to um, incorporate. And what does stable mean, right? When you say, does my tumor grow? Your doctor will say it's stable. And you'll say, well, it's grown. And your doctor will say it's stable. And you're not talking the same language. So... Again, all tumors typically grow, but if, you know, when they grow a certain extent, then we say it's changed. And I wouldn't say it's very important for neuroendocrine tumors, but your provider might not be a you know, neuroendocrine tumor person, might be a specialist. So they might use this language called response, stable, partial response. This is a language that oncologists use where growth means very specifically 30% increase in unidimensional size of a number of lesions. So there's a very specific criteria, but basically means 30% growth. 
Um, so what does that mean for you when you tell your, your physician it grows and he says that it's stable? Well, it could grow, but still be stable. So it could still grow a little bit, but still not reach the threshold to be considered progression or growth. So sometimes the language barrier you have to get over and talk to your doctor a little bit and just be more specific. Say, hey, if it's okay, what does this mean? Does it mean, I think the most important thing, the, the, do you need to change your treatment? That's, I think, the main question. So that's your litmus test for, okay, things are significantly different. You know, if the doctor's saying, well, there's a little bit of change and everything is great, that means that's great. That's what you want. If the doctor says there's some change, but we, we need to change your treatment, then that's your cue for like, okay, this is something significant. Or if the doctor says, well, I'm going to present your case at the tumor board, I'm going to order imaging, that probably is a sign that, okay, there's enough growth here to warrant some further investigation. So I think those are the levels. But if your doctor is telling you, yes, there is growth, but everything is good, that usually means that, you know, everything is okay and a little bit of growth is to be expected. That's really helpful how you clarified all of that. And also, you know, you kind of started going into what I was going to ask next about um, follow-up labs and, and imaging or scans. So just kind of to clarify, because um, you kind of talked about tumor markers and chromogranulin A, what labs do I need to get and how often? Okay, that's a great question. I think a lot about this <laughs> because we often order a lot of tests and everybody gets kind of upset and sometimes thrown off. So let, let's talk about this. So if you have a, now this is the thing with tumor markers, they're very specific to the type of cancer that you have in neuroendocrine tumors. So some markers work for some patients, some markers don't work for other patients. So let's talk about mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors. I think a 24-hour urine for 5-HIAA is really the gold standard tumor marker. Not everybody is going to have it. It's not going to be high for everybody. But if it is, it's very useful, reproducible, and gives your physician some kind of information they can use to kind of understand not only what's going on today, but what might need to be done in the future. Chromogranin is a general marker for neuroendocrine tumors that's nonspecific, which means that it can go up for many number of reasons. For example, um, when you check the chromogranin in regards to when you eat, it can make a big change in it. So it should always be done when you're fasting. So don't forget, chromogranin should be done fasting. And if you're on a proton pump inhibitor or other medications, it can also significantly change your results. So there's another issue. And then the other thing is like, what does a change in chromogranin really mean? You know, again, a little bit of an increase, a slow increase in your chromogranin wouldn't be concerning to me. Big changes in your chromogranin that are unexplainable might warrant additional testing, but you know, like scans. But I, I think for the most part, I would make sure that the conditions that you used, meaning you were fasting both times, uh, meaning that you're on the same medications both times, or off the PPIs and off those medications that can alter it. And also labs, you know, sometimes you check a chromogranin at lab A, lab B is using a different assay. You're going to be getting two completely different results and it's nothing, to, and it's the same result, it's the same number, right? It's just two different labs, you know, have different ways of computing it. So got to be a little bit careful about that too. That's helpful. I I'm sure you get this question very often, what does it mean that my chromogranulin A is all of a sudden very high? Right. It happens all the time. And it doesn't seem like it would necessarily worry you. Well, you know, I think it warrants a discussion. It warrants an exploration. I mean, it happens to us at least once a week where we, we have a conversation about an elevated chromogranulin and what it means. So it's definitely happens. It's definitely important to our patients to understand it. And you just got to go through the steps, you know, understanding what, what it is, what is it, what are the limitations of the test? What can the test really tell us? How can it help us? And at the same time, we don't want it to derail us either or make us make decisions that aren't helpful. So put it within the context of what it means. It's important. Mm -hmm. Look at the whole person. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and you were also talking about scans and thank you for talking about, you know, CT um, and MRI and then also the functional imaging with the um, dotate um, somatostatin receptor imaging scans. So 
I guess kind of to follow up on that, what scans do I need to get and how often, I guess. And another point of clarification is, should I be getting a CT or MRI scan? And what's the difference? Man, so I, I don't, uh, okay. Let's just talk about basic principles. If you have a low grade tumor, you need pictures less often than if you have a high grade tumor. Um, CT and MRI are what we call cross-sectional imaging. Usually they're interchangeable. Although MRIs have a very good fidelity for liver and oftentimes are used for patients with liver disease that are being monitored because it's very reproducible. CT scans and the, the way they show the liver lesions are very dependent on the timing of the contrast provided. So to try to explain this to you, when you get a CT scan, they inject IV contrast in you. And then they, based on the timing of the, how many seconds it takes after the injection to when you go through the scan is when the contrast will be in your liver. So there's certain ways to time it, but that timing is very variable from scan to scan. And it can really dramatically change the way your neuroendocrine tumors appear to the radiologist versus a real change in the tumors themselves. MRIs, because of the technology to use, is not based on these types of issues. So it's much more reproducible test. So if you're using liver lesions as your index, or you're using liver tumors as your index lesions, a lot of times we use MRIs just because they're very reproducible, very easy to compare You know, every six months or so. And neuroendocrine tumors, because of their vascularity, they just really stick out nicely in an MRI. You can see even the smallest little lesions which is kind of reassuring to surgeons who are thinking about surgery, to your, your cancer doctors. It really, it feels very comforting to have that much, I guess, that much clarity into the organ itself. It's really great. And then, so how often? More often if you have a high grade tumor and less often if you have a low grade tumor. And then what kind of scan? So you always need a gallium 68, or what we called functional imaging, PET scan. These are all terms that are synonymous with each other. Um, somat, you know, somatostatin receptor scan. You need, you need that definitely at diagnosis and you need it whenever there's a change in your scans. Now, how often otherwise you need it in other circumstances, it's very hard to give anyone like a, some kind of definite answer. It really would depend on what the scenario is. Generally speaking, you can't get them more than once a year, but you can if you need to do these them for PRT or peptide receptor radiotherapy. So again, you definitely should get one at diagnosis, definitely should get one when your tumors have changed. I always, I mean, definitely before a major surgery, those are like key points in your journey when you want the high power test. That's very helpful. Um, I really like the way that you explain things. So um, in a way that's easy to understand. And, you know, talking about all these terms and everything, um, I know that you talked about how important it is to know things like the primary site and the grade and where it's metastasized. Another term that comes up a lot is if the tumors are functional or non-functional. Right, functional. So how do I know if the tumors are functional or non-functional? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And you know what I mean? What's so funny is that functional versus non-functional can actually mean different things to different people. I think it, it's good to define different types of functional. So when, I, when I'm saying functional, it means that you have a syndrome attached to your tumor. The syndromes that are attached to tumors occur based on the site. So if you have a mid-gut tumor, the most common functional syndrome is carcinoid syndrome. And it doesn't occur in all patients. Yeah, and not all patients whose tumors secrete serotonin will have symptoms. So it's a very nuanced and complex situation. So how do you tell? Basically, you need to see if you have a mid-gut tumor, you want to know if you're flushing or have diarrhea. And you want to check the urine 24-hour test. And between those tests, you'll probably get a good idea whether or not your tumor is making serotonin and what needs to be done about it. In any of our patients that have carcinoid syndrome, we're much more likely to use some medicine analog therapy, much more likely to do surveillance of the cardiac heart valves, 
it's definitely uh, important to determine and to treat accordingly. The same goes for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, which also have a, a, a number of syndromes. Now, a lot of times, if you have just a tumor in the pancreas and nowhere else, and you're gonna go get surgery, it might not be crucial, but I, I still recommend it. Every pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor should be tested for all the functional tests just to make sure, because sometimes you can have a functional tumor, but you just don't notice the symptoms and it could become important down the road. And so there are a number of synd you know, syndromes and things that we test for. I'll go try to go in, in order of most likely. So serum gastrin is important to check to make sure you don't have a gastrinoma. Uh, gastrinomas, this, the hormone gastrin that the tumors can produce can cause diarrhea, interestingly. It doesn't really cause flushing. It also can cause stomach ulcers. It's very important to check it. And the treatment's a little bit different for gastrinomas because we use proton pump inhibitors a lot in the treatment of those tumors. Other serum hormones to check include insulin and proinsulin. So a lot of times these tumors can secrete these hormones that cause your blood sugar to go down. Um, but sometimes the blood sugar doesn't go down, but they're secreting it. So it's important to know about it and to keep it in the back of your mind in case you need it for later, especially for post-surgical surveillance. And then there's uh, tumors called glucagonomas that secrete the tumor glucagon. Those are important to also consider. Uh, there's some tumors that secrete a, a hormone called VIP, which is really rare, um, but it's also important to consider. And then there are other, you know, somatostatin producing tumors. We're getting even rarer. There's ghrelin producing tumors, even rare. Like, like you can go down the rabbit hole of really rare ones. So I don't think we need to do that. But the point being that these are the things that we need to know about at diagnosis. If you do have a functional tumor, usually it means that we do have a good hormone that we can use to also determine how you're doing with your treatment. You know. We have a measure of your disease. And it's also important to know that if you have a functional tumor, the biology of your disease is somewhat different. And the approach that we would take is somewhat different than if you don't have a syndrome. So when a patient has a functional tumor that's causing a syndrome, we take that into account. We use the syndrome as our scan. So we sometimes say to you, okay, how many times did you flush today? How many bowel movements are you having over the last few days? over the last few weeks. You know, if someone has an insulinoma, they'll always keep a glucose diary. And I'll be able to say, okay, for the last month, this is what your blood sugars have been. So you can get real world, real time feedback on what's happening with the disease instead of waiting for scans every so often. And so it's important. And also these, these syndromes, most neuroendocrine tumors are silent but if you have a syndrome, they actually can be quite pesky. They can cause you know, you know, issues that you have to deal with. Not the worst in the world, but definitely, definitely something that you have to, you know, would decrease your quality of life, maybe limit your ability to enjoy activities with your family and friends, to leave the house, to work and be productive. These are things that are really important to address and actually different than non-functional tumors. So it's actually a, a lot, so it's quite different. Although they have a lot in common, there are really significant differences between them. So I would say for patients whose disease is localized, probably the differences is quite small. But for patients who have metastatic disease, identifying these syndromes and treating them appropriately are really important. That's really helpful. Um, and before we get to the last question, if you don't mind just kind of going back and clarifying um, another term, um, you were talking, when we were talking about how long do I have, you said, you know, primary site matters, the grade and where it metastasized. So can, can we do go back and kind of clarify grade and also sure. the primary site, I guess, especially after someone has the primary site removed, do you still go by that site where it originated or do you call it now? Like, for example, if it's only in the liver, do you just call it liver nets? Yeah, so the name of your net always goes by the site where it started, especially when you're talking prognosis, because it kind of gives you an idea, a better idea of what's going to happen. So that's that. So grade, what does grade mean? Grade is a, is a way that pathologists are communicating to us 
how aggressive or how what the growth rate of the tumor is going to be. So do we use grade one, two, and three? The easiest way to remember this is just based on the KI-67. People are grouped into these three grades. Uh, grade one is low grade, grade two is intermediate grade, and grade three is considered high grade. But the KI-67 goes from zero to 100. Now that's one way to categorize tumors. Another way is by differentiation, which is well differentiated and poor differentiated. And well differentiated usually is low grade and poorly differentiated is usually high grade. Now, and what does that all mean as far as your prognosis? Well, we can, we understand a lot more about the disease and what to expect based on the site of origin and those different features. Once we have those pieces of information, we really know a lot. For example, if I know that you have a rectal neuroendocrine tumor arising out of a polyp that's low grade and small in size that was removed by a polypectomy on an endoscopy, I'll know that a lot about your prognosis, which is actually going to be quite excellent and your ability for these things to metastasize is quite low. And we know that not only from personal experience, but based on you know, looking at huge databases such as the SEER database. And similar conclusions can be made based on you know, whether or not you have what type of lung carcinoid you have or pancreatic, et cetera. Based on you know, the size, the grade, we can give you prognostic information that could be helpful. This is all very helpful and it helps us to kind of understand um, what we as patients or loved ones, allies, need to know in going into an appointment with you um, or another net expert. So the last question I have for you is, how can we as patients or caregivers, loved ones, help you as our net oncologist make the appointment go better or help you do your job better? Well, I mean, I think um, the net community has been very... Uh supportive and helpful and and just patient with the, all the providers i mean they're going through a difficult and rare diagnosis and dealing with a lot of people who don't know that much on how to help them i do think one way to really help this process along is to connect with lacnets to you know it's it's a lot easier when the time and the appointment can be supported by a lot of background information so you can be caught up to speed on all the different questions you might have. I mean, if you have a certain amount of knowledge about your disease, then your appointments with your doctors can be done much more efficiently. And I think, you know, the LACNIS has a abundant number of resources to really help you be prepared um, and knowledgeable so that when you go into your appointments and when you go in to meet with your providers, you know exactly what you need to get out of those appointments and the information that you need back. And I think that would be something that would be better, you know, helpful for the patients themselves, because I feel sometimes I feel bad for them. I feel like their time with me when they really want to ask A, B, and C, but they're, they're confused about some other things. And so they can never, you know, get to all the things they want to talk about, you know, that are really important to them, or sometimes they'll get confused or they'll be sidetracked. So the more information they have, you know, I find my most knowledgeable patients are the ones who are, are happiest with the visits because they really pin me down say, okay, I know all this, and I want you to tell me this. This is what I want to really need to know about. So yeah, I think the more educated you are as a patient, the more satisfied you're going to be with your care that you receive. Absolutely. And go to Thanks. LACNETS, go to the website. What's the name of the program that you do? The, the Net, Net Vitals. Vitals. Net Vitals, everyone. And how does the Net Vitals help you? Because some of the patients will say, hey, I filled it out. My doctor didn't look at it. So how, how does it help you if a patient fills it out? Well, it helps make sure that we have all the information needed. This, this is like the information that's kind of like passport info, that's what's necessary to travel around and to, get, to be able to communicate your case to anyone at any time. Um, so that, I think this type of information is crucial. I mean, net providers all speak a similar language. So that's the language that we need to really understand how to triage patients to the best care plans possible. So yeah, you always fill that out. Don't worry if you're, the one provider might not, the other one might. But the support staff for sure is using it, your intake staff, people are putting together these charts and no information needs to be communicated or definitely taken into account. That's all very helpful. Thank you yeah. so much, Dr. Hendon. All right. Um, you're very, Hi, so, very insightful and also really appreciate um, your dedication and hard work for the whole community. So thank okay. you so much. It's been a fun conversation and we hope to talk to you again. Thanks for having me, Lisa. Always a pleasure Thanks. to talk to you. Thank you so much. Take care.
Thanks for listening to the LACNETS podcast. We want to thank our presenting sponsors, Ipsen Pharmaceutical and Advanced Accelerator Applications. For more information about neuroendocrine cancer, go to www.lacnets.org.